right. <laughs> Grooving it up. How you doing, y'all? You doing good? Good. Glad you guys are all here. Welcome, Village Church. Welcome to all of our sites. Uh, if you are here at the Surrey site or Langley North, Langley South, Coquitlam, Abbotsford, Calgary, online, we are so glad you are part of this movement called Village Church. Crazy stuff Jesus is doing all over the world, really. We get people that are actually becoming members of Village Church online, and they're from countries all over the world. So special welcome to you, too. And man, we're going to be planting uh, Village Church Winnipeg and two Village Churches in Toronto as well, my hometown. T dot. <laughs> so that's all coming probably in the next year and a half or so. So man, during COVID, we haven't slowed down. We've wanted people to meet Jesus and to continue pushing forward with the mission that God has given to us. So we're super pumped about it. So glad that you are here and you're a part of this thing too. If you got a Bible, Galatians chapter five uh, is where we're pulling out some of these nine keys. And maybe you're here or watching this because you're kind of, okay, nine keys of happiness. I want happiness in my life. We've been saying through this series that happiness is kind of the thing that drives all of our lives. We're all after joy. We're all after our own happiness. It's the reason you married who you married, eat what you eat, wear what you wear. The decisions you make in life are driven by your own happiness. And what I'm trying to say through this series is the gospel is actually the ultimate answer to your own happiness in ways that you could never even understand because what we tend to do is go after all of these things in the world to give us happiness and Jesus comes along and he says, all of that stuff will fail, it will crush you, it will let you down. Even for those of you with great marriages, this is one of the temptations. You go toward your marriage and you think my spouse is gonna make me happy and of course they fumble it, they let them let you, let you down all the time. Yesterday I had to do a big dump run and I was taking garbage out to the, to the dump and my wife's like, okay, be back in like half an hour. I'm like, for sure. And then I ended up getting lost and I'm sitting at the carpet store and I'm getting tacos and she's calling me. She's like, what are you doing? I'm like, right, right. I have to come home. So these are things that we always let each other down, down, down. We mess up. We, 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 we accidentally do something. And, and if you look to people or money or fame or reputation or beauty, all that stuff will let you down, but Jesus will never let you down. And that's the whole point of this series. And in Galatians 5, Paul frames out these ideas of these nine keys. And he lists a whole bunch of ways to live your life that will derail your life. And he says that's the way of what he calls the flesh, meaning that's the way of our humanness trying to get joy through human endeavors versus transcendent ones. Because we all start out, some of you are atheists or agnostics and you're here. We're glad that you're here. You're exploring Christianity. Some of you have a naturalistic view of the world. So you go after things that you think are gonna make you happy. And Paul says that's actually the way to derail your life. And then in Galatians 5, Verse 22, he says, but the fruit of the spirit, the spirit of God that you get by putting your faith and trust in Jesus and Jesus alone. And then he starts this list of these keys. And he says, is love, joy, we've done both of those. And now this week we hit the next two, which is peace and patience. So peace and patience. And those two things are actually connected. These are keys to your own happiness, to your own joy in life. Because when we get peace, which is one of the things we're all seeking in our life, then patience actually follows, right? When you have a calmness of soul and spirit and life, when there's something about you that is just, you've got, you understand certain things, so there's a peace in you, then patience is the natural outflow of that. And that's why I'm taking them together. I uh, years ago started uh, playing poker uh, just, just for cultural research. I don't believe in it because uh, I'm a pastor. And one of the things about, playing poker, when I first started, like way back when I was like 18 or 19, and my dad showed me, we play with like dimes. Uh, you, you, you get a hand and you just wanna be in every hand. So you wanna play all, and you get two cards, your whole cards, and you look at them, and it's seven, two offsuit, which is the worst hand you can get in poker. Sorry, this is not a poker lesson. So <laughs> you're like, okay. Um, yeah, and so I'm re and, and you just want to play every hand. You want to just, so you put in your money and you put in your ante and someone raised it and you put it in because you want to see the flop because maybe you'll get a seven and maybe you'll get a two. And very quickly you learn that that's not the way to play poker because you're going to run out of money very quick. The really pros only play the top 10 or 20 hands depending on where they are seated and the pot odds and all of these statistical data. But the reality is, if you're anxious and you keep just looking down at your car, you're never gonna, that's why when you see the pros, they got headphones on, they're reading a novel because they're only playing a hand every once in a while. 
That's the kind of reality where we need patience in our life. And we live in a culture that has no patience right now. Everybody wants to get the quick fix. And the only time you can get the kind of patience is by having a peace and a calmness. You know certain data and ergo, you have a patience about your life that we desperately need because we live in a time where nobody has any patience. It's always now, 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 now. We live in a generation, you don't even have to wait to buy stuff anymore. Right, this is the whole, remember that SNL sketch back in the day where it's like, you know, hey, here's a book on how to save money. And it was like, it's only one page. It's don't spend money you don't have. And then there's just a debate about like, but what if I really want that thing? Do you have the money? No, then don't get it. But what if I want it? It's just like, you don't understand. But we're in a generation that's like, I wanna go on vacation. I want that thing. I don't wanna save up. Right, remember my, my grandparents, man, my grandfather's 99 years old, um, still alive, amazingly. Um, he, he couldn't just like, okay, I wanna do whatever I want. It was like, I'm gonna work for two years, then I'm gonna take my family on vacation. That is not the generation I grew up in. It's not the generation we have now. The generation now is, I wanna be the boss now. And it's like, okay, you're 22 and you have no experience. I know, but I'd be a really good boss. It's like, shut up and stock a shelf. And we're like, but, but my spirit feels, what about my inward? Shut up and stock a shelf. We have no patience, but we want to arrive with no pain. We don't want the slow road to get there. And here's the problem. We follow what some theologians call the three mile an hour God, who is so slow at doing everything that you want him to do, that the only way to get through life and flourish is to have a divine patience that says, I might not be able to get this thing now, but in the long run, I trust that God is in such control that I know we're gonna get where he wants me to go. And what happens then is that your whole soul shifts and you're able to get a supernatural reality of both peace and therefore patience in your life. That's the idea. Think about driving. When you're driving your car, if you're going to meet friends and you're all just gonna hang out for the night, you're driving, you hit a red light, you hit a red light, not a big deal, it's a red light. And so you're not in a hurry, you're just chilling out. But if you are going to a meeting where your boss is gonna get you in trouble, where there's something stressful that's gonna go on in your life. You're actually like, you hit a red light, let's go, let's go, let's move, come on. We get out of the way and you're beeping, you're honking, you're moving around because you're all so stressed out, ergo patience goes away. And the Bible comes along and it says, how do you actually find peace then? Because peace is one of the deepest fundamental longings of the human soul. In the end, what you and I are looking for is peace. And the Bible says, I want to give you a peace that surpasses understanding, God says. God and the Bible are constantly on about you getting peace. And some of you, that's the biggest thing in your life. Your marriage is, is kind of disrupted. Your money life is disrupted. Your, your family life, your work life, your relationship life, your so whatever it is. And you're like, man, I don't have peace in my life. And the pining and yearning of all of humankind is to ultimately have peace. And you might be going, yeah, but I didn't think Christianity was about peace. I thought, like we talked about last week with joy, I thought Christianity was about truth. I thought Christianity was about morality. No, we're gonna hit very clearly. I'm gonna hit just a whole bunch of Bible texts and explain what they're doing and, and, and bring them into our own life as we see that the God of the universe cares about your peace. So here they are. Galatians chapter five. We already saw this. Love, joy, peace. Uh, the interesting thing about that is Paul, of course, is writing into the Roman Empire. And at the time, the Roman Empire had something called, have you ever heard the term Pax Romana? It's the Latin for Pax is the Latin word for peace. So Rome would constantly preach that they were bringing Pax Romana to the world. They were bringing the peace of Rome into the citizens of the Roman Empire. And so you really wanted to become a citizen of the Roman Empire in order to get peace. And of course, Paul later in Philippians says, no, no, our citizenship is where? Our citizenship is in heaven. And so if you, if you are a citizen of the Roman Empire, you get peace. No, no, Paul says, if you're a citizen of Jesus, you get peace. Meaning your politicians can't give you peace. 
Your Rome can't give you peace. Caesar can't give you peace. The conservative government can't give you peace. The liberal government can't give you peace. The Green Party can't give you peace. The NDP can't give you peace. Nobody on planet Earth is going to be able to give you peace except Jesus. This is what Paul's talking about. This is why he says, don't believe the lie of Pax Romana. Don't believe the lie of, of Pax Canadiana, right? Whatever of Americana, of the empires, of things that you look at posters and you think, well, if I just had a body like that, I could have peace. If I just had all that money, I could have peace. If I just had those friends on Instagram, I could have peace. And Paul undercuts it all and says, it's a lie that will shrivel your soul over time because you will exhaust yourself trying to get something that is so elusive because it's not found in those things. And so he says, love, joy, peace. There's a hundred other passages in the Bible that talk about this. Let's go through all hundred. Okay, we might not get all hundred. So John chapter 14. Here's the beautiful words of Jesus. Now I want some of you, you show up here and you're stressed out in life and you're anxious in life. Listen to the beautiful words of Jesus to you in John chapter 14. He says this. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. I love that. Jesus is addressing one of the deepest felt needs that we have in life. Martin Lloyd-Jones, who was a preacher back in the 1940s and the 50s, he was actually a, a doctor, uh, like a medical doctor, a family doctor, a physician. And when World War II happened, he started preaching in England and, and is now known as one of the great preachers of the 20th century. Here's what Martin Lloyd-Jones said. He said, it can truthfully be said that the greatest need of men and women in this world is the need of what is called a quiet heart, a heart at leisure from itself. And that's the idea. We all pine for the kind of peace instead of a ruptured soul where you and I are just going around, we're not really sure what to do, and what are the things that steal peace from us? Ultimately, one of the great things that steals peace from us is fear. We all, we all the thing that disrupts our soul, the thing that doesn't let us quiet down and just be, is the fears we all have. And, I, and if you think about the fears that you have in life, some of you are fearful of, of somebody, some of you are fearful of, um, of public speaking. Right, you, you would rather, like, my job to you, you're, like, you're freaking, you would freak out if someone said you have to get up and talk. As Seinfeld years ago pointed out, if you're at a funeral, statistically, about 98% of people, their biggest fear is public speaking, and their second biggest fear is death. And so Seinfeld pointed out, you'd rather be in the casket at a funeral than the one doing the eulogy, Right? Some of you have massive fears in your life. I have a fear of flying. I don't like flying. I don't know why, because I fly a bunch for my job. The, I, I, partly why is because I'm in a tin thing, 30,000 feet in the air that could drop out of the sky at any moment. It's logical. It makes sense to me. Other people, that's no big deal. They just get on there, fall asleep. I look around at the people that are sleeping on a plane before we take off. I'm like, how are you sleeping right now? We're about to all die. And whenever I'm walking down the aisle, I'm just looking at all the faces. I'm like, that's definitely the face of someone who's on CTV tonight. Their face is there, died in a plane crash. That guy, definitely. That's what all these people look like, or just the group of people that I'm going down with. Right? This is my mental processing. Uh, so the other day, I was going into Toronto uh, to do some, some uh, vision stuff, and the plane's coming into Toronto, and it's just about to land, and then all of a sudden it goes, and it goes back up. The wheels were already down. I'm like, what's happening right now? So then I'm picturing this narrative where the co-pilot's up there fighting the other pilot, and he's trying to crash it on purpose because he's depressed. I'm like, ah! And it was just, we just, <laughs> we just had to go around and come back down again. Why? See, these are fears that we all have in life. Some of you are fearful of raising your kids. Some of you are fearful of where your next paycheck's gonna come from. There's insecurities in all of our lives. But here's the challenge. The Christian, listen to me, the Christian, and I know this doesn't seem like it's the case right now. The Christian is the person in the world that shows everybody 
There's a peace in the midst of the chaos. So Lloyd-Jones goes on and he says this, in a sense, a Christian without peace is a contradiction in terms. We are living in a pragmatic age. People today are not primarily interested in truth, but in results. The one question they ask is, does it work? They're frantically seeking and searching for something that can help them. Nothing is more important, therefore, than that we should be delivered from a condition which gives other people the impression that to be a Christian means to be morbid and scorn delight, right? And I would say to give the message to the world that we're stressed and flustered is also not to be Christian. We are to be, listen to the image, and I tell our lead pastors this all the time who are in the fight trying to love and serve you as a church. And there are times where there's tension and there's, and there's pain and there's difficulty and they're walking through things with you and trying to love you. And, and I talk about the idea that, guys, the temptation is going to be to be flustered, to be chaotic, to be frantic. But think of yourself, and I say this to all of us as Christians in the world, think of yourself as the flight attendant on that plane. And I'm sitting there and the plane starts to shake and there's one of two things. Either the flight attendant is pouring coffee or they're looking around going, oh my gosh, oh my gosh, oh my gosh. And they're like, you know, lighting a cigarette and sitting down or whatever. If the flight attendant is freaking out, we all freak out. But when that plane starts to shake, don't we all look up at the flight attendant? And if they're just chilling out, pouring coffee, laughing, we go, okay, everything's cool. We're good. She doesn't know anything. He doesn't know anything I don't know. But if they're all freaking out, like meeting in a huddle and starting to pray, things aren't good. And right now, the world, in its franticness, in its, in its time of fear, is looking to people who follow Jesus when they're saying, what are they doing? Now, are we pouring coffee or are we freaking out? We are to be a thermostat for a culture rather than a thermometer. A thermometer just checks what is the temperature and then just react, just says, oh my goodness, that's the temperature. Thermostat, you set the temperature. And followers of Jesus are meant to set the temperature for a culture and say, listen, I know things are difficult, but I'm chill because I know the end of this thing. I know how this story ends. Jesus Christ is on a big horse, riding down, <laughs> saving the world. And so I can be calm in the midst of the chaos. Jesus says, I bring you peace. Psalm four, verse eight says this, in peace, I will both lie down and sleep. For you alone, O Lord, make me dwell in safety. I used to read that passage every night when I went to bed. <clears throat> I would sit and just read Psalm 4. I'm going to bed in peace because you bring the calmness. You bring the peace. And this is the beautiful thing. The, the, the dual offer of the gospel is that Christianity can give you a quiet heart and that nothing else can. That's what we got to understand in life. Philippians chapter 4 says this, do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be known to God. Think about culturally, this is one of the biggest practical things the gospel heals in people's lives, which is anxiety. Let me give you some stats from the U.S. because I couldn't find any great stats from Canada, but I could find some for the U.S. So listen to some of these stats and then just apply them uh, to Canadian numbers. Um, Anxiety disorders are the most common mental illness in the United States of America. Think about that. Anxiety disorders are the most common form of mental illness in the United States, affecting 40 million people. Um, 40 million adults in the, in, the, uh, in the age of 18 and older, or 18% of the population every year. People with anxiety disorder are three to five times more likely to go to the doctor. In fact, a high percentage of just general, you go to the doctor to check out what's wrong with you, doctors report a high percentage of that 
has nothing to do with physical stuff that's wrong with you. It's anxiety and stress in your life that's causing you to actually go to your doctor and say, here's what's wrong with me. I think something's wrong with me. Very high percentage actually has to do with anxiety and stress. Specific phobias affect 19 million adults or 9% of the U.S. population. Obsessive compulsive disorder and post-traumatic stress disorder are closely related to anxiety disorders, which some may experience at the same time along with depression. Anxiety disorders affect 25% of children between 13 and 18 years old. Research shows that untreated children with anxiety disorders are at a higher risk to perform poorly in school, miss out on important social experience, and engage in substance abuse. Now, this is where Jesus comes in. He says, listen, it's not that, you know, accept Jesus and therefore you have no more anxiety in your life. I'm talking about... I'm talking about the deeper level stresses at a fundamental core soul level that create a situation where we get into anxiety in our life and stress. And the gospel comes along. And the beautiful thing about it is the Bible says, look, I'm not just giving you how to get to heaven when you die. I'm giving you things about your felt practical reality needs in the day-to-day, Monday-to-Friday life that you've got where Jesus Christ is the answer to those things. I had a friend... This week, on, I noticed on uh, social, he was kind of freaking out. And he's like, I can't believe all the QR codes. I can't believe the mass. I don't know what this means for my kids. I can't believe this. I can't believe... And he just kind of freaked out. He says, I can't be on Facebook anymore. I'm going off this thing for a while. And I just went, oh, shoot. And I just, I just texted him. Um, he's from another country. I just texted him. I said, hey, bro, you okay? And he's like, I don't know, man. Just all this stress in life. I don't know what to... And I'm just like, hey, just, just realize. And this is something I'll talk about in, in a few minutes. Just realize, man. Jesus is still on the throne. And the only solution ultimately is to recognize that because there's two options in our life when we become fearful and we lack peace. We end up going to things that take it away at a temporal level like drugs or shopping or porn, whatever your drug of choice is, you go to these things to take away the stress and the unrest in your soul, but it only works for temporary. It only affects for a certain time, and then you need to hit that again, and you need to hit that again, you need to hit that again. It's what in Freedom Session we call the drug of choice. Everyone has one. Something you do that tries to take away the unrest in your soul, and the problem is it only works temporarily in your life, and then you have to hit it again. So you can either go to those things constantly in life, or Christianity comes along and says, or you go to God himself. You submit to God himself John chapter 16, listen to the words of Jesus. I have said these things to you, that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation, but take heart, I have overcome the world. Notice what he says gives peace. Not something you do. I have overcome the world. Not something about you, listen, but something about him. Right, that's what actually brings peace in your life. Not something about your circumstances, not something about your attitude, not something about you. I have actually accomplished something. I have overcome the world. Let me give you an example from my own life about what I mean by this. Um, So you guys know because if you've been to the church before, you watch me kind of have these weird habits where my face kind of ticks around and I make these weird noises and all that. And that's if you've been here for any time, know it's from Tourette syndrome, but also from obsessive compulsive disorder, which is an anxiety disorder uh, that came about when my parents got divorced when I was like eight or nine years old, and I would do all these habits. As I shared with you a couple weeks ago, uh, I would do the one where I went down on my knees at school, and my knees would get soaking wet, and I'd be smoking cigarettes, and I'd go to, and I was like, why is this guy going down on his knees every two seconds? Or I'd go past a post and I hit a post and I keep walking. And then if I didn't go back and hit that post three more times, then that meant someone that I knew would die of a disease. And so every moment I was in school, every, every, every time I'm like, I'm doing it. And Meryl's telling me like, I, I did, this was a habit I had. You know? So it's like, <laughs> so you're like, I'm offended too bad. So it's like, I had this like, and I hit things and ran and make them. And all of that world was a world where I was doing certain things out of stress disorder and anxiety disorder because I was trying to control the world. I thought that if I did those things, I could control this result and that result. And what had to happen to me, listen to me, what had to happen to me, what shifted in me wasn't coming to understand anything about myself. 
See, this is what you're going to be told every time you go to the, to the grocery store and look at a magazine shelf. Or look, and they say, here are the tech. They go right to techniques. Here's the way to solve the anxiety of your life. Make sure you get a good work rhythm. Make sure you take a vacation. Make sure you breathe. Make sure you relax. Make sure you have these candles and they're 50% off right now. All these techniques and stuff that's about you and none of that stuff works in the end because it didn't for you. You know what solved me? Was coming to understand as I read the scriptures, the deep reality of the sovereignty of God that he is actually the one in control of all things, not me. And once I read the scriptures and started to see that, all of those little things went away and I stopped having to tap certain things because God is in control of all things, not me. And here's where I think the level of stress and anxiety has reached us to such a point that we don't even know what to do anymore. Even the younger generation, as I raised three girls, in this culture, you can pray for me and fast for me every day because I'm trying to figure out what to do. Think about this though. We live in a culture that tells us that in the end, it's the sin of Adam and Eve. It's the sin of the Tower of Babel, which is this. You are God. Science has eliminated God. Education has eliminated God. Media has eliminated God. Don't you know? We're so advanced, we've progressed so much that really you are God. You're the one in control. You don't need a transcendent being in your life. And so we've been teaching this stuff for the last 100, 150 years. And of course, anxiety is gonna come up in our life because I'm the, I'm, my inner feelings are God. So I need to live a life that adapts to my inner feelings and my inner identity. Think about it this way, we are a culture that has elevated not science, not philosophy, not art, not politics, but psychology. That is now the ruling discipline where we wanna get into our brains, figure out our identity, and how, whatever your identity is, then you're supposed to live that out in the world. That's all anyone's talking about anymore. Why? Because once your identities figure out, then you can play your life out, and now you're God. You're in control, and here's what happens. We die under that pressure because we were never designed to absorb it. We die and get crushed under the pressure of needing to be in control and, need, and, and think about all the, inf look, we know way too much, right? Like we know every murder that takes place now. Right back in the day, you would read the newspaper and you'd just be like, okay, America and Russia are trying to get to the moon. Pass the toast. Now every murder, every rape, every crash, every car, everything that happens, it's on your newsfeed. And not only do you hear about it, you watch it happen. I was watching videos the other day on YouTube and it was like people getting robbed and killed them. I'm like, why am I watching this? It's stressing me out. How do you think a generation's gonna get raised when they know everything about everything? Every news story, you know everything that's taking place in every country in the world. Of course you're stressed out. Why? Because it's the sin of Adam and Eve. I wanna be God and you can't bear it, man. So of course we have an epidemic of stress and anxiety because we took God out of the equation and he's not allowed to absorb any of that for us. We got to do it. We got to do it ourselves and we got to do it with one another and that's what we're told. And the gospel comes along and goes, guys, guys, take heart. I have overcome the world, not you. Isaiah 53, but he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Listen to this. The punishment that brought us peace was on him, meaning Jesus, and by his wounds we are healed. One of the great goals of salvation, one of the great goals of the death and resurrection of Jesus is to bring us peace. Notice he doesn't say anything about, hey, he, he brings you to heaven when you die. Yes, of course, beautiful. 
but he brings you peace. Jesus, listen, Jesus, do you ever think about Jesus on the cross crying out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Sitting in the garden, sweating, because he, and saying, God, can you take this cup from me? What is that about? Here's what it's about. Listen, here's what it's about. And why you can't keep looking to technique and looking to yourself to solve all your problems and breathing a lot and going on vacations and sitting on the beach and meditating as a solution to your thing. Here's why. Jesus Christ went through the greatest levels of stress and anxiety in your place. He sweated in the garden so that you don't have to. He is your substitute. He is stress incarnate. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Think about that prayer. Jesus Christ from the cross after being beaten, flogged, is screaming. Why have you forsaken me? Crying out to God. Now listen, uh, a guy named Bill Lane, who's a commentator on the book of Mark, puts it this way about that cry of dereliction, that scream that Jesus had. He says this, listen to this. He said, crucified criminals ordinarily suffered complete exhaustion and for long periods were unconscious on the cross before they died. The stark realism of Mark's account describes a sudden Violent death. The cry of Jesus expresses unfathomable pain. Guys, Jesus lost all of his peace so that you could have eternal peace. It's the only way to solve this for you because you keep looking to yourself and that's not the answer. Listen to 2 Timothy chapter 1. For God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and what? Of a sound mind. Calmness and poise to your life comes from God, not from you. It's an inner calmness and peace that comes not from circumstances, which means that you got all the confidence in the world, guys. It means like... Have you ever met someone who's super desperate for like attention? If you haven't, just go get an account on Instagram and scroll. Because you get half naked people dancing, doing challenges, showing you their perfect life. You know what that is? It's a desperation. It's a neediness. I want attention. I want to be affirmed. My daddy never loved me, never told me I was good enough. So I'll get every, all these strangers to do it. Have you, have you ever dated somebody who's just needy? They're just constantly like, tell me I'm beautiful. Tell me I'm good. Tell me I'm fun. Tell me you love me. It's like, Bruh! Where does that come from? They got no peace. Their soul is still looking around. It's in the sea being tossed by the waves. It has not found land. It is not confident in itself. And yet Paul says, see, God brings a sound mind. Remember that text from the book of Numbers that people pray all the time, the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be merciful unto you. May he give you peace. Uh, I remember a text like that was super important to me at a time when I needed it. I wasn't sure what I was going to do with my life. I, had, I was 19. I had signed up to go to one of the local colleges uh, of where I lived, and I was going to go. I didn't really know what I was going to do, but that summer I was like, okay, I think I'm going to go into the film industry. And then so I met with a counselor at the college. And they said, no, you should go into public relations. And I'm like, don't know what that is, but sure, sign me up. And then I had this group of people around me, and they were like, no, you need to go to Bible college, and you need to go into ministry, and you got these gifts and this calling, and you should be this and that. And I was so confused in life. And so I went to my parents. I'm like, I think I'm supposed to go to Bible college. They're like, well, what is that? I'm like, I don't know. And they said, okay, you can try it for a year, but then you're going back to normal school. I'm like, totally makes sense. And I had this disruption of soul. I was confused. 
And I went to my first day, I remember my first day of Bible college, my first class at Tyndale in Toronto. I walked into class and I sat down and I was so confused and I looked around at all these strangers and I didn't know what I was going to do with my life, man. I was a scared 19-year-old kid. And I remember the teacher, he was probably six foot five and just this big bear of a man. And right at the end of the thing, he looked out and he said, I want you all to stand. And he prayed and read that numbers prayer over us. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May his face shine upon you and be merciful unto you and give you peace. And I remember in that moment, everything settled. And I was like, this is where I'm supposed to be. This is what the gospel answers for us. May he give you peace. And then it says, his, may his face shine upon you. See, that's not, that's not like generally there's a God in life. Some of you are like, okay, so what you're saying is I need to just believe that God exists and then I'm going to get peace in life. So what I said. May his face shine upon you. That's not like God exists. That's, see, when you're at a dinner party and you're sitting around with 10 people, they could all say you're there and you could all say you're present with everybody, but... It's when you start to have a conversation with someone face to face that now there's relationship. Now there's intimacy. And that's what that text in the book of Numbers is saying. May his face look at you. Not he exists. He looks you in the face. And you look back and you know him. You have a personal relationship with him. That's where the peace is. It's not a reward as C.S. Lewis once said, you were wondering where the C.S. Lewis quote was coming. You're like, huh, he hasn't quoted C.S. Lewis in 40 minutes. Okay. <laughs> C.S. Lewis once put it this way, and I love this image. He said this, joy and peace are not a kind of reward that God hands out to people who believe in him. Joy and peace actually come almost more like when you're standing close to the water of a fountain you can do nothing but get wet. But when you walk away from that fountain, you can do nothing but shrivel and go dry. The image is proximity is what brings you the peace. Not as reward, but as the natural result because this is the God of peace. This is the one who brings peace. And this is the problem. When we try to find peace in every other area, it has an opposite effect. We're overloaded with the stress of the world. And so then we begin to make this deduction, as many Christians do, and I'm not critical of them, but I had a conversation with a guy recently, and he was like, this is the end times. This is the end times. And I'm like, okay, why is it the end times? Well, we got this, we got that, we got vaccines, we got, we got QR codes, we got everything. It's the end times, it's the end times. Jesus is going to come back any minute, it's the end times. I'm like, okay, how long have you been a Christian? Oh, like two years. Okay. So here's the problem. Every Christian through all of time thought it was the end times. No, no, this is the end times. Yeah, yeah, I know, I know. But in the 80s, it was the end times. 88 reasons why the rapture is going to happen in 1988. Some of you are old enough to have read that book and based your life on it. And then it didn't happen, and so he updated it to 89 reasons why the rapture is going to happen in 1989. Ronald Reagan has six letters in each three of his names. That's the mark of the beast, 666. The Antichrist, Ronald Reagan. Martin Luther in the 1500s thought it was the end of the world. 1960s, everyone thought it. 1940s, World War II. 1918, Spanish flu, 35 million people dead. It's the end times. Jesus is coming back. I said, have you, I, I was looking to talk to this guy. I said, have you ever heard of something called Y2K? He's like, no, never heard of it. I'm like, right. If you had existed in a church in 1999, you would have heard of Y2K, right? Right, because Y2K was because they forgot to put a thing in the computer. That means all computers are all going to shut down at the same time, and there'll be no more power. All the hospitals are going to go crazy because they're going to be plugging in the machines going, what's happening? And everyone's going to be zombies out in the street. Planes will fall from the sky. I did believe that. Um, there will be utter chaos because all computers will shut. Y2K, it's the end of the world. It's the end times. And people were, I was at a Baptist church 
They were storing food up, putting cans away, hiding away, making, and they were getting buying generators. I think there was a guy in the church probably who sold generators. So he was just like, make sure you get your generators. Here's my card. All right, it's like, everyone's buying freaking generators. Like it was the end of the world. And then nothing. Because you gotta have perspective. Oh, I never heard of that, but I know this is the end. Okay, could be. Or in 14,700 years. But in the midst of it all, do you look frantic and chaotic? Or do you follow the God who gives you power and love and a sound mind? Do you believe the kingdom is coming and God's will is being done on earth as it is in heaven? Do you believe, as Jesus said in Mark 3, that the strong man is actually being tied up so that the kingdom of God can come right now? Do you believe, when you read the book of Revelation, you know the book of Revelation, uh, so many of you, I know, you, 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 think, you think this is a game show and you can just email me and say, please preach on Revelation as if I listen to you. <laughs> so, <laughs> but if we did, many of you probably wouldn't like what you hear because, you see, I did... Greek for three years, and I looked at what these words actually mean in life. You know, and the, and the word revelation, singular, by the way, is the word apocalypsis. And what it means is revealing. It doesn't mean prediction about what the future looks like. Yes, that's in there. It's a revealing. It's as if there's a curtain, and it gets pulled back, and John sees some stuff. Not just about the future, but about the present. And the question is, of the whole book, and this is what um, one, of the, one of the writers I was reading recently, he said this, the defining question of the book of Revelation when you read it is this, can you really believe in the midst of the chaos and the pain and the fear that you face when you look around the world, that, listen to me, that things are not as they seem? That when you see the fear and you see the pain and you see the disruption and you see the chaos, when the veil gets pulled back, do you still recognize that the lamb is on the throne? Do you still see that he's in control? Do you still see the angels worshiping in the midst of the chaos? Do you still see the God who is actually leading and guiding? Because if you do, going to have peace because you know he's got it. This is that scene in uh, there's a deleted scene in one of my favorite movies of all time, Gladiator. And the Christians are in the midst of the gladiatorial arena and the lions are let out and all these Christians who won't pinch incense to Caesar get thrown in the middle of it and they get mauled by these lions, which happened in the first century a lot. I know we're being pe persecuted as well. Um, uh, but these guys were eaten by lions. They were put on stakes and flamed up in Nero's gardens just because they wouldn't pinch incense to Caesar. They wouldn't follow the ways and they would follow Jesus and love Jesus and worship him versus worship Caesar. And they would put them in the gladiatorial arenas and there's this scene where the lion walks up to these Christians and they're lined up and just starts mauling them. But on their face is absolute peace. Because they know where they're going, man. They know the end of the story. And so that starts to work backwards when you know where it's all headed. See, here's the problem with trying to answer our level of stress and anxiety and fear in life by technique. It's not by technique because there's a whole worldview that is hopeless and going nowhere that undergirds our whole culture, atheism, is not going to create peace in your life, right? We are just animals living by instinct. There's no morality, there's no purpose, there's no meaning, you die and that's it. We've been teaching that for about 150 years. No wonder everyone's stressed out. Listen to Richard Dawkins. This is a great quote from Richard Dawkins, the very famous Atheist, this is what he says in one of his books, Evolutionary Thinker. Some of you are exactly there and you're thinking, you don't believe in God yet, you're journeying. This is what he says. The total amount of suffering per year in the natural world 
is beyond all decent contemplation. During the minute that it takes me to compose this sentence, thousands of animals are being eaten alive, many are, others are running for their lives, whimpering with fear, others are slowly being devoured from within by parasites, thousands of all kinds are uh, dying of starvation, thirst, and disease. In a universe of electrons and selfish genes, blind physical forces and genetic replication, some people are going to get hurt, other people are going to get lucky, and you won't find any rhyme or reason in any of it, nor any justice. The universe that we observe has precisely the properties that we should expect, if is, at the bottom, there is no design, no purpose, no evil, no good, nothing but pitiless indifference. <laughs> good night! Thanks for coming! Your life has no meaning. There is no evil. There is no good. There is no justice to be done to your friend that got raped, killed, whatever, whatever disease, whatever problems you have. Don't you get it? The universe is, has a pitiless indifference to anything. There's no meaning. No wonder we're stressed. We've even taken away the myth level existence that we used to have where we were part of something. We were part of an adventure. We were part of doing something meaningful with our life that even if life handed us a bad hand, we still had some transcendent purpose to fight for, some meaning to frame our life within. And atheism and agnosticism has taken that away. And once you have that peace, there's a patience that comes about in life. And that's why the two are together. I was sitting in a restaurant working on this um, this week, and I'm sitting there, and the guy behind me is in there reading and trying to figure out a couple of things. The guy behind me comes in, and he just starts coughing. And I'm like, oh, we're not even allowed to cough anymore, guys. We know this, right? <laughs> like, you can't cough in public anymore. <laughs> He's like, oh, my gosh, that guy's got COVID. Uh, so... I'm sitting there quietly reading and this guy's coughing and hacking and making noise. And he's talking to everyone so loud and I'm like sitting there just trying to chill. And I'm like, and I started to get mad at the guy. I started resenting his, how his family raised him. I, I, I mean, just, I just went, I went from zero to a hundred in a second. And I was like, what is this guy? This problem? He's coughing and making noise. Why are you giving COVID? And I'm like, you're writing a sermon on peace, chill. Do you not have any calmness in your life at all? You're freaking out about this guy? Chill. Have some patience, man. John Broadhead, one of, the, uh, uh, one of our executive pastors, senior executive pastor of our church, always looks at me in the midst of stress and anxiety and wanting to make things happen, reach people for Jesus. And he, and he always looks at me, he says something that I want to tell you because it's great advice. He says... He says this about ministry, but I'm just going to say it about life. Life is a marathon, not a sprint, guys. And there's going to be ups and downs and long running and difficult moments. It's not a sprint. You don't have to get there quickly. And when you have a peace and a calmness in your life, here's where I think we get most of our anxiety and stress from and we lack the peace of Christ. We borrow trouble. My wife... She does this all the time. She borrows trouble. She, she like, she, she, we were walking in a building the other day and she sees this like, this little box to catch, you know, rats and stuff. And we walk up, she's like, well, this place has a rat problem. Better tell someone. I'm like, it's not your problem. And then we were at this other thing and she's like looking at the schedule. She's like, well, if this schedule, uh, that person might not be able to make that. I'm like, Again, not your problem. Everywhere she goes, she wants to be able to help. And I'm like, it's way easier not to help anybody. <laughs> if this restaurant fails because the menu's wrong, it fails. Yeah, but I can help. But you don't have to. Because you're borrowing trouble all the time. Stay in your lane. Don't borrow trouble. A guy I know who was really smart, named Jesus Christ, said the same thing. Tomorrow has enough trouble of its own, so stop being anxious. Okay, you're right, you're right. I tell my executive assistant this too. She comes up with all these scenarios of what could happen. 
you gotta go here, you gotta do this, you gotta do this. I go, <laughs> stop borrowing trouble. Chill, peace, be calm, all will be well. <laughs> I follow the God who gives a sound mind, but she needs to be stressed for me, which I appreciate. Lord, I pray for our spirits that are totally disheveled and frantic at a moment like this. Rightfully so, as the last 18 months has been extremely difficult, <clears throat> weird, sad. The unknowns are plentiful. But here's Christianity offering the solution to our greatest disruption. Jesus Christ, the one who died on a cross, can give us peace, which results in patience. Let it come all across, everybody listening, watching this right now in these rooms. Let us feel the spirit just descend and drop on us to understand you are God and we are not. And because that's true, the peace and the patience that comes of it is life-changing in every way. Do that work among us. In Jesus' great name we pray. Amen.